My name is Svetlana Beckman. I will be your moderator today. Uh, this is the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. This is our Sunday program, Sunday morning program. I welcome uh, folks in the um, live audience as well as the YouTube land. Um, so we'll have our presentation. Um, and then during Q&A, you'll be able to ask questions and engage in lively dialogue, hopefully, <clears throat> about this really important topic. So before I introduce our speaker and our topic, I want to tell you um, just a few words about humanism, as we are the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. So here is how the Nordic Humanist Manifesto describes humanism. Humanism is a secular life stance. Its starting point is that humans are part of nature, born free and equal in dignity and rights, equipped with reason and conscience. Humanists hold that there is no predetermined meaning to existence. We are all free to find meaning and purpose in our own lives through individual reflection, social interactions, and the rich culture humanity has created in science, philosophy, and the arts. So there's, there's a take on humanism. All right, now on to the program. So during the summer, we um, entertain or we feature our own members, and they share with us their hobbies, interests, and expertise, and in the process, we get to know each other better. And so our speaker today is EHS member and Skokie Sustainability Commissioner, Charlie Sachs. Charlie will tell us about Skokie's uh, recently adopted ambitious plan to promote community-wide climate resilience and sustainability. Uh, the plan was adopted in December 22, and it identifies the risks of climate change for Skokie and outlines an implementation framework with an array of strategies and specific actions for municipal operations, services, and program initiatives. Charlie will present a summary of the elements of the plan, how the plan was developed, and what the plan means for local residents and businesses. And as I said, during the Q&A, you'll be invited to engage in a conversation about how we as individuals can address global climate change. Our programs here during the summer and at other times of the year address a wide variety of topics, including current events, philosophy, arts, and sciences, to name just a few. And today's presentation is part of our ongoing programming related to environment and local government. So welcome, Charlie. Uh, thank you, Svetlana, and uh, thanks to everybody here. And it's a, a pleasure to be here to, to make this presentation. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the sustainability plan. I am a member of the Skokie Sustainable Environment Advisory Commission, but a couple of caveats. I, the, I'm going to make, present information that is going to be informative, informational about the plan and some of the activities in Skokie. I don't speak for the commission. Uh, I don't speak for the village. And there's some points, some, while this is going to be primarily informational, there are going to be some perspectives that I present that are my own views. Uh, and just keep that in mind as uh, we're going through this. Also. I know a lot about this, but I don't know everything. So there's probably a lot going on that you may be aware of or that's going on that I can't, that I am not necessarily presenting today. So just keep that in mind as, a, as, a, as we're going through this. But there is quite a bit here. The plan is a pretty detailed plan, has a lot going on, it's, and it's, it's really good. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll get some idea of what's going on in Skokie. Um, and some of the, and if you're not a Skokie resident, some of the things that you might be able to do in your own communities. So the uh, outline for the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about my own baseline assumptions about climate change and climate action. Um, I'll talk about the impacts of climate change, the direct uh, impacts as well as indirect impacts of climate change in Northeast Illinois and, and Skokie specifically. Talk a little bit about the background of sustainability initiatives in Skokie uh, over the years, a very brief summary of that. We'll go into a little bit more detail about the actual plan for 2022. Uh, again, it'll be a sort of high level overview and I'll highlight a couple of initiatives. There's a lot in the plan. Uh, if you're interested, there's uh, uh, information available online where you can go into more detail. Talk a little bit about community climate action. So there's this, the municipal uh, climate action plan, but there's also a lot of activity that's going on by various civic groups in Skokie that is really important for uh, sustainability in our community. And then lastly, what we can do. Some, just some general suggestions 
about what we can do as a community and also as individuals uh, to promote sustainability. So some of my baseline assumptions, and I know that the sustainability, you know, can be a controversial uh, subject. It also, I think there's a very subjective perspectives on it. Um, I don't think it's black and white. I think that depending on where you are, you may have different points of view. Uh, these are my basic points of view and they, they inform how I approach things. Um, climate change is real, it's here and it's now. It's happening and it's happening here and it's happening now. Uh, it's more than just the climate. We talk a lot about carbon reduction, carbon footprint, uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, and things like that, greenhouse gases which affect global warming. But uh, climate change and, uh, and uh, sustainability, uh, sustainability specifically in, it incorporates and includes our entire ecosystem. So there are things that are going on in the, in the ecosystem and in our environment that are critical for sustainability that are not necessarily uh, greenhouse gases or climate change. Uh, it also affects our economy and it impacts our society. So these are all issues that come up with uh, sustainability. When we're talking about sustainability, we need to keep these things in mind. We live in the uh, Anthropocene epoch. I, I don't know, that's a kind of an odd word, but basically what that means is that um, human activity is impacting and affecting and changing our ecosystems and our, uh, and our environment, and we're responsible for that as human beings, and we have a responsibility to do something about it. Um, I personally think that we, we currently have all the tools, resources, and capabilities that we need to respond to this challenge. Um, what we have in place now, the, the, our capabilities now, are what we, you know, we have what we need to do something. Our biggest challenge is inertia, and that is actually moving on this and, and, and making the change. And there are a lot of reasons for that, and a lot of valid reasons for that. Um, but what, the, what, what we need to do to really start moving on it in my personal view is not only do we need to take the steps, the small steps, but we really need to change the way we think and the, and the way we live. Um, and you know, my point of view is either we do the change or the change does us. This is a pretty uh, existential challenge that we have and we need to respond to it. And lastly, we're not gonna get rescued. There's not gonna be any magic technology. There's not gonna be any uh, you know, uh, super government program or any kind of innovation that comes out and and makes things better. We're going to have to we're going to have to address this directly and um, and uh, take this on uh, individually as well as collectively. So climate change, the impacts of climate change, specifically for Northeast Illinois, we are we are fortunate that we don't have hurricanes, we don't have a lot of wildfires, we don't have a, a major river basin that's drying up. Uh, and so you know, in a lot of ways, climate change is. The, the direct and more dramatic impacts are happening elsewhere. But there are things that are happening in, in Skokie and Northeast Illinois that we need to pay attention to. The uh, panel on the left there looking back shows what's happened in Skokie over the last 40 years. And on the right it shows what's anticipated over the next, uh, through, the, ne through the, the rest of this century. And as you can see, what we're experiencing are warmer annual average temperatures, particularly in winter. Um, we're seeing an increase in extreme heat days increase in heavy rainfall events, uh, increased drought potential. So there's a lot more variability in, in our weather patterns that's happening. Um, and one of the other side effects of this is we have a longer mosquito se season and that introduces an increased ri risk of vector-borne diseases. Uh, and then there's some numbers that, uh, there that show that. So what's the impact of this? Well, these have economic impacts. It costs things. There's an economic uh, cost to these things. There's public health risks and impacts. We experience environmental de degradation. There's stress on our infrastructure. So when we have heavy rain events, uh, it, it impacts our sewer and water. We have to plan for that. We have to uh, account for that in our capital planning and spending. Uh, there's social disruption, and we're experiencing this now. Um, you know, fortunately, we don't have any major revolutions happening uh, imminently here in Skokie and the north suburbs, but. Uh, something like, for example, with the uh, migration crisis, uh, with uh, uh, migrants being shipped up to Chicago from Texas, that's indirectly a climate, uh, climate migration. People are leaving Central America because of the uh, failing of their economies and their, their social structures that is, that is aggravated by climate impacts, the inability to grow food and the like. They're coming up to North America looking for opportunity. 
Uh, Texas is not too thrilled about that, so they ship them up here to Chicago, and then we have a situation that we have to deal with with Chicago. There's going to be more of that kind of thing, and these are things that sort of have a variety of causes and reasons for them, but that we're going to experience more of those kind of things. Um, if we do not respond to climate change and allow the climate change to uh, impact us, we will experience a diminished quality of life. Uh, parenthetically, at the end of all this, you know, it's, I'm, I'm sort of focused on the doom and gloom stuff, but uh, there is some significant opportunity. It, uh, two things, I'll talk about some of the co-benefits of climate action uh, in terms of the benefits uh, for us as a community, but uh, Northeast Illinois and the Great Lakes region uh, is being looked at as a climate haven. So it's one of the areas where uh, the effects of climate change will not be as adverse as other regions and that there'll be uh, an attraction for people to, to come to uh, this area particularly, and there's some op a lot of opportunity that comes along with that. There is some evidence that that's already beginning to happen, that there are people moving into the Great Lakes region uh, to, to um, uh, get away from uh, climate, uh, adverse climate impacts in other parts of the country. So what's been happening in Skokie? For, well, for the past 40 years, Skokie's been doing some things. In, in 1988, there was a pilot curbside recycling program that now has evolved into the recycling that we have on a weekly basis. Um, in the early 2000s, we established the Sustainable Environment Advisory Commission. I've been a member of that commission since about 2015, so for about eight years. Um, the commission, along with the Public Health Department, adopted the 2016 Sustainability Plan. Uh, I would describe the 2016 Sustainability Plan as sustainability light. I think it had some good uh, set of priorities and identified some good, object, uh, good goals, but it did not have uh, a detailed analysis. It did not uh, outline specific uh, measurable objectives. Um, and so, consequently, it, it didn't have a lot of uh, weight behind it, and uh, it was kind of a struggle to get some of the things implemented that were recommended in there. Some things we did do, we actually, the Sustainability Commission is a good group of people and they're really committed to this uh, and there's some good ideas. And some of the things that we have done uh, since the 2016 plan was we, the village enrolled in the Soul Smart program, which is a U.S. Department of Energy program to encourage municipalities to adopt standards that encourage um, solar installation. We, uh, the village signed on with the Greenest Region Co Compact, which is a compact from the um, uh, Chicago Land Mayor's Caucus uh, that uh, outlines standards and, and, um, and recommendations for municipal um, sustainability policies. We adopted a complete streets ordinance, which is an ordinance that, is, that um, uh, encourages the village to consider alternate means of transportation besides vehicles in transportation planning and, uh, and the like. So things like active transportation, transit um, as well when they're doing development projects. Uh, we've uh, got the textile recycling program through Simple Recycling well, it's, uh, where you can sign up, you can request a pickup uh, on your, from your house and you, if you have textiles that need to be recycled, they'll come and get them for you. And we've also been really pushing for, uh, over the years we've pushed for composting, backyard composting, which was, there was some resistance to that because of the concern for uh, rats and the like, uh, but we were able to do a demonstration project to show that it wasn't a problem. And uh, that has now evolved that we now have a pickup service through collective resources out of Evanston, so you can uh, have, have your composting picked up uh, on a subscription basis. We hit COVID. Everything was thrown up in the air with COVID. Things got uh, derailed for a couple of years. We came back from COVID. There was a number of things that happened um, uh, during that period and we, uh, the village went ahead and, and uh, based on the 2016 sustainability plan, completed a greenhouse gas inventory. Greenhouse gas inventory is just an inventory of the activities that are generating greenhouse gases. This is an important measure for sort of looking at your existing conditions and helping to map out what you can do to reduce that. Um, and then eventually we came on to the 2022 sustainability plan, which is where we are today. 
So the planning process was, uh, we, we ended up hiring a consultant, uh, this firm called Pale Blue Dot. They've done a number of sustainability plans in the Chicago area. They're very good, um, and it was a very detailed and uh, rigorous process that uh, over an eight-month planning period, so it was pretty fast, actually. Eight months, for the amount of work that was done, it was pretty done pretty quickly. Uh, there were 900 community members that provided input to the plan, so we had a, a really broad um, participation and we solicited a lot of good input from community members. There's a lot of people out there that are very thoughtful uh, and provided some really helpful perspectives on things. We had a planning team of about 33 people that really did the deep dive into very specific kind of actions and strategies that the village could take. Uh, the consultant conducted five foundational research study documents that provide a lot of baseline data on what's going on in Skokie and helps to sort of map that out, and then there were two online community input surveys. So this is a list of the, the baseline studies. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but I think that one thing that's really important about these baseline studies and what's really important about this plan is it does go into detail. It has measurable, it measures things specifically. It doesn't just talk about things in general terms, and that helps us to really identify very specific steps that we can take to mitigate the impact of, of climate change and to, and to contribute to um, minimizing our carbon footprint and building a more sustainable environment. It also gives us something we can measure our progress. So how are we doing, the outcomes? Not just the things we do, but whether, the, whether what we're doing is working. And that's really important because there's gonna be things we do that don't work. Uh, there are gonna be things that we do that have unintended consequences. There are gonna be things that we do that um, that work really well, work better than expected. And then there's going to be changes that happen that we didn't anticipate that are going to have an impact. And it's really nice to know what specifically is happening where so that we can um, think strategically and act effectively. So some of the, after the study, so this is some of the baseline data on where Skokie is. And these numbers might not mean anything. They're pretty impressive though. So there's 700, Skokie generates 726,000 metric tons of CO2 uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases. So CO2 equivalent, there are a number of greenhouse gases. There's carbon dioxide, there's methane, those are the two big ones. Then there's nitrous oxide um, and ozone. Um, and they have different, they, they, they uh, evaluate it based on a CO2 equivalent. So, so for example, methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas. So what that means is greenhouse gas, the effect of that just is, is that the radiant energy comes in from the sun, it hits the planet, the atmosphere captures some of that radiant energy and helps create a blanket around the planet. So if we didn't have an atmosphere, the average temperature of the, of the Earth would be about 18, well, about zero degrees Fahrenheit. Right now, the average temperature of the Earth is about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So we need these greenhouse gases to make the Earth livable. The problem is if we introduce more greenhouse gases or too many, there's a balance. And if we introduce more, then the planet heats up and it creates the, the effects that we're seeing with the warming planet. Um, so we want to we wanna get that balance. We want to get back to that balance because the, the natural cycles can, can sequester and handle the certain amount of output of greenhouse gases. But if we over if we over put in too much, then it, then it's beyond the capacity of the planet to maintain a healthy balance. And so that's the challenge that we're trying to address. Um, vehicle miles dri driven, Skokie drives 506 million miles per year. Uh, we consume about 2.7 billion gallons of water, and we generate about 24,000 tons of solid waste. So what does that mean? Compared to other communities in Chicago, we're about average. We're right sort of in the mid, mid range. We do, we do actually, our vehicle miles traveled is probably a little better than average, uh, for, particularly for suburban communities. Um, and we're, you know, but we're right in the mid range. We're a pretty typical suburban Midwest community. So what is generating our greenhouse gases? What are the source of uh, our carbon emissions? So. Um, is it, this chart is kind of a busy chart, but I'll explain it real briefly. You can see that 31%, almost 32% of the greenhouse gases generated by Skokie is related to the generation of electricity that is, that is used in Skokie. 27%, uh, 27.5% is from natural gas that we use in our buildings. So that means our buildings 
and our built environment is responsible for about, uh, what is that, 60% of our greenhouse gas generation. 35% is our transportation, our motor vehicles. So between buildings and transportation, it's about 95%, 90, 94, 95% of the greenhouse gas emissions. That's really important to know because then that tells us what we need to do to address our carbon emissions. And so that plays into the strategies coming down. We also, uh, solid waste generates a certain amount. Uh, that's generally from the methane from, that's created in landfills. And about 30% of our uh, solid waste that goes into landfills is food waste. Um, so that introduces some other uh, opportunities for one, addressing, client, uh, addressing greenhouse gases, but also to address the issue of food insecurity in our community. And then there's water and wastewater. When it comes to handling water, Skokie's actually pretty good. We do a pretty good job with it. There's always room for improvement and there are some challenges, but Skokie's actually in a pretty good place there. So our goal, the 2022 plan goal, is to reduce community-wide greenhouse gas emissions by 35% below 2020 levels by 2030. So that's a pretty aggressive plan to reduce our greenhouse gas levels in the next seven years. And to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, that means no, no net uh, output of carbon, of carbon dioxide greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. So what is that percent will come from buildings? Now we, we noted that it's about 60% that comes from buildings, 35% from, from transportation. So we're gonna do very aggressively on the transportation and we're gonna start, we're gonna begin the process on the buildings. And I think part of that thinking is, is that, and this gets to the inertia, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done to get our buildings to a point where we're getting them to carbon neutral. But there are opportunities right now where we can reduce our transportation and our vehicle emissions. So I talked about the impacts of the opportunities for uh, that climate change and climate action present to us. Uh, some of these opportunities are what called, uh, are based on these co-benefits, are called co-benefits of climate action. And there's a whole listing of them in this, um, but in general, you know, there can be reduced costs, improved economy if we uh, uh, do some of these things, uh, can promote economic development, um, it can improve air quality, uh, in, in pr protect our ecosystems, uh, help with habitat loss, and help with the ecosystem development. Uh, but overall, we're looking at climate action as not only an opportunity to deal with uh, the environmental challenges, but to really look at it as an opportunity to improve our quality of life. So the plan framework, the way the plan is structured, and it's a pretty big document, uh, and it's worth a look at, but there are nine strategic sectors. So there are nine areas that are strategic sectors. And each of those strategic sectors identifies four, 43 specific strategies for community-wide goals to achieve these goals. And within those strategies are 189 action items. So these are very specific item, action items that will be taken on by the village to actually uh, to pursue these strategies um, that are identified in the plan. And this is over an eight year period. Well, we're now seven months into the plan, uh, so we have about um, a little more than seven years to do this. Um, the thing about the plan is that it's not merely a municipal plan. It's not merely what the municipality does, but it involves everybody. So the implicit in this is an engagement with the community and a mobilization of community resources to, to move towards these objectives. And there's been a very uh, intentional effort to do that uh, in, the, in the seven months since the plan has uh, gone into effect. So this is a little wash, so, oh, it looks good up there. Okay, so, um, so the community-wide strategic sectors, there's transportation mobility, land use and housing, for example, health and safety, waste management, there are nine of those. And then there's a 10th sector which is called cross-cutting and those are those are initiatives that cut across multiple sectors or across the entire thing. And we'll, we'll, we'll and then, okay, so, so anyway, this is that the, the nine strategic sectors plus the cross-cutting. Within each sector, there are sector goals. So in transportation and mobility, for example, there's a listing of these goals, uh, reducing, um, 
reducing you know, the uh, emissions by reducing vehicle miles traveled, that's doing less driving, encouraging and uh, stimulating more transit use, and electrifying our automobiles. That's, those are some of the sector goals, general goals, that are outlined in this plan. As you can see, there's a list of strategies. There's seven strategies. Each sector has its own set of strategies. We'll talk a little bit about the strategies in a moment. Uh, and then each of the strategies has very specific actions that I talked about. And each one of these actions are very specific about things that the village can do, who's going to do them, and when they're going to get done. There's a phase, you see the phase column on the right there. The phasing is sort of a prioritization, not necessarily in terms of importance, but in terms of when it gets started. So a phase one action is something that can be taken right away, done immediately. Phase two might have a dependency on a phase one, or it's something that has, uh, you know, needs some time. And then phase three would be something that would be toward the end, latter half of the plan period in, uh, in the eight-year plan period. So looking at some of the strategic sectors and some of the strategies, there's a whole list of them, as you said, and then, as I said earlier, and then I, what I've done is I've highlighted a couple of them that I think are going to be pretty impactful and also uh, maybe a bit of a heavy lift and have implications well beyond the sustainability plan itself. Um, so the big one in transportation mobility is decreasing community-wide vehicle miles traveled. This means doing less driving. So I think this is going to be a challenge. This means really changing the way we do things. Um, and it's going, to, it's going to be difficult for the village to do this alone uh, as a municipality, but there are things that we can do to do that. But it's, uh, it's, it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, another one that was identified is increasing the utilization of work from home. So this is a, this is a carryover from uh, COVID when there was a big work from home thing, and this is sort of leaning into that. Um, that also has some implications. You know, what does it mean? And we, I don't think we've fully figured out what it means to have so many people working from home or, or the hybrid work. We're still sort of learning this as it goes on. So I think that has a pretty big impact on our, on our lifestyle and the way we do things. Um, for land units and housing, there's a very explicit recommendation that we increase the density, make things more compact, increase the number of people that are living per acre uh, in Skokie. This is the intent there is to um, uh, take advantage and make the most use of, the, of our uh, land resources as possible. Uh, buildings and energy, a uh, big push on electrification. That, that's been something that's been happening throughout. All, you hear a lot about, about electrifying our buildings and reducing that. There's a recommendation to do that in Skokie and also to really increase the on-site renewable energy. Now, according to this, the, you know, this plan, 0.12% of energy in Skokie is generated through on-site, primarily solar. Talk about increasing that to 2%. Well, that's a 16-fold increase. I was on a bike ride yesterday and, uh, with a group, and one of the people said, wow, it's interesting how many homes in Skokie now have solar panels. Well, imagine increasing that by 16 times, and that's what we're, that's what we're looking to do with this plan. Um, waste management decreasing waste landfill, landfill waste by 10%. We want to increase the amount of, uh, decrease the amount of material that's going into the landfill. Uh, increase recycling, uh, hopefully just decrease the amount of waste we're generating. Uh, but a big part of that is also food waste. See if we can uh, compost and reduce the amount of food waste that we have going into the uh, waste stream. Uh, recently, the village changed its uh, service, uh, garbage pickup service, from twice a week to once a week. Uh, so that's been a big change for Skokie. There was a lot of resistance to doing that. It was kind of weird. Actually, it was a very strange <laughs> debate, but um, uh, they did that. And the initial indicators is that, well, when, when uh, I've been talking about reducing the garbage pickup to once a week for years for a lot of reasons, and my hypothesis was that twice a week garbage pickup encourages generating more garbage. Um, I had no real data on that. Um, but that was my, my, my hypothesis and my argument for saying we really should reduce that. <clears throat> the, it's too early to come to any kind of conclusion about what the impact has been, uh, but two things are notable. One, the village, was, village officials were very worried about a big backlash to reducing the service. None of that has occurred. There have been people who have asked, uh, you know, about having a second toter, for example, um, a second garbage can, 
basically uh, it, because they generate more volume for whatever reason. There have been a handful, about a, of, of the thousands of households in Skokie, 120 have asked for a second uh, garbage can. There's been no real uprising of rebellion from reducing the service. And in fact, what has been experienced is that there is a reduced uh, tonnage of waste that is coming through the, through the village. So uh, there are a couple of variables, a couple of uh, factors that play into that, but it's actually working out really well. Uh, I said uh, Skokie's pretty good with uh, water and wastewater, and, uh, but there is, an, a, you know, I think a, a desire to reduce the community-wide uh, consumption of water uh, further, and so that'll be something to see how that ha plays out. Skokie also has very good uh, municipal services, emergency services, and it has a pretty good public health uh, department, so I think we're in a good place there to help with some of the um, some of the impacts of the increased, you know, the public health impacts of increased heat and other vector-borne diseases and things like that. Um, but we will need to be cognizant of um, vulnerable populations uh, going into the future. Um, I mentioned um, uh, we also have a section on local food, food and agriculture, um, and we're talking about reducing uh, food waste. Um, there's a significant opportunity. Um, for Skokie to um, contribute to uh, a situation that <clears throat> reduces the amount of food waste that's being generated by businesses and, uh, and households in the village, one through composting primarily, but also effectively using our, our food. Now, I talked to Bonnie Agnesani at the uh, Niles Township Food Pantry, and she was telling me about some of her programs. And she does a lot of work that's really good about taking food that's surplus food from grocery stores and restaurants and then recirculating that to families and households that, that need that additional, uh, that need that, you know, that food. Um, and the food insecurity problem in Niles Township and in Skokie is pretty significant. 10% uh, of households in Niles Township live below poverty. And if people know what p poverty level income is, that's really poor. Uh, you don't have to live below poverty to be food insecure. There are many households in Skokie that experience food insecurity. In other words, there's uncertainty about getting the food that they need for their household and their family. And the Niles Township Food Pantry is, is, has done a, uh, a pretty good, a really good job in, you know, I mean, obviously it's a huge problem. They can't solve it themselves, but they're very well organized and they have a very good program that can be uh, a template for improving the efficiency of uh, the utilization of our food resources that would, one, help reduce our carbon footprint, but also to promote some more equity and, uh, and make Skokie, uh, for those households, you know, to provide an important resource um, within our community. This one's a fun one, green spaces and trees. Replace 8% of our turf community-wide with alternative natives and other plants. That means get rid of your grass. I, you know, it's been a kind of interesting. I, I, I say some things that some people look at me and they're kind of goofy, and one of the things I say to people, well, grass isn't green. <clears throat> and uh, if you work from home and you listen to the landscapers and the leaf blowers and all that kind of stuff, you realize, yeah, grass is not green. It's kind of, there, you know, it's a, uh, I describe it as me mechanically manicured and chemically treated. Um, and we, we, and I think that, there's a, it's kind of, it's kind of a funny thing because it's a, it's just the habit, you know. The people just do it. They don't even think about it. It's like you have a lawn. That's what you do. Um, this year we uh, really promoted and it got a lot of, uh, got a lot of play elsewhere. This no mow may um, initiative, and you, and if you could look around, you'll see a lot of sort of shaggy lawns, um, and and it, and it looks kind of funny. It is kind of funny, and I, and and all I can say is, well, it's kind of a work in progress. <laughs> We're, we're trying to figure this out. But I think there's, what, what's really encouraging about it is people are thinking about it. Like, okay, why am I doing this? You know, is there a better way to do this? You know, we, for example, have allowed our grass to grow longer. We, we don't have a shaggy lawn, but we do, we've allowed the grass to grow longer so that the idea is it'll be uh, ultimately healthier and, and it requires less maintenance. Um, and more and more people are doing this. And, and some people are saying, wow, it's, it's kind of cool to have, you know, native plants or wild grass or whatever. Um, and I, I think there'll be an evolution of that, but hopefully um, we'll, we'll be more uh, 
will be uh, more intentional and, and effective at, at, at creating lawns and gardens that are more sustainable moving forward. Uh, economic development is another one. One of the things that I highlighted here was promoting sustainable businesses and business practices. I think that's one thing that we can do very intentionally and, and effectively as a, as a community is to really encourage businesses and to support businesses that are uh, in employing and engaged in, um, in uh, sustainable practices. Uh, this one specifically talks about B Corps certified. A B Corps certification is uh, a pretty, re pretty involved kind of certification. There's a, an organization that will hand you, an, give you an inventory and evaluate uh, your practices and things you're doing and you'll get a certification from them. I think there's a lot of levels up to that that we can encourage businesses and support businesses that are doing some sustainable activity. Uh, there is also an opportunity with the shift, you know, the investment in electrification and the, uh, invest in, uh, the investment in alternative energies to promote other economic activities that are locally based that are involved in renewables and sustainable practices. So there's some economic development opportunities there. Um, Cross-cutting actions, um, I'm, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but the, the village of Skokie has, uh, the, I've highlighted the continue to build internal capacity. The village of Skokie is hiring a sustainability coordinator. Uh, we've been talking about this for some time. Sustainability has really fallen under the purview of the Public Works Department, and uh, we have some really good staff, we have a lot of really good staff in Skokie, and our Public Works Department is actually really well run and, and uh, we've got some good staff that are very, very attuned to sustainability and, and making these initiatives work. But implementing a plan like this and implementing a sustainability strategy is really more than can be just handled as another thing you do. Uh, so it's been really important for, and we've been pushing this for a while, for the village to hire a sustainability coordinator, somebody who's really dedicated to concentrate and focus on this. And Skokie has has it in the 2024 budget, they're gonna, which is the fiscal year, which has started in May, I think, um, and they are in the process of hiring somebody, so we should have somebody on soon who's gonna be doing this. So that's a very positive thing. So how is, how is Skokie going about implementing this plan? So there's a couple of uh, key elements within the village of Skokie, within the municipal apparatus to, to actually execute on this plan, and so far, it's been really good. The, there's been a, um, an effort organized through the village manager's office under which the sustainability coordinator is gonna work to organize what they've created as an environmental sustainability action team. And this is a, uh, a team of <clears throat> staff members from all the departments in the village who meet on a regular basis and they've created a project plan and action plan to incorporate the action items into their operations. And so uh, they've been meeting since the plan was adopted and they've been um, uh, developing and incorporating these uh, things into their, into their routine operations. They've been incorporating into their departmental budgets. And so this is being baked into the operation of the village, which is a really, really good thing. Um, it, 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 it's interesting how long it took to get us to this point um, and to be honest with you, it wasn't always easy and the village wasn't always, um, you know, on board with it, but the, through a series of recent events, which I can talk a little bit more later if we have time, um, the village has come around and, and started doing this and the work has been very good so far. Uh, the, the sustainability action team, they create quarterly reports. The Sustainability Environment Advisory Commission, we're, we, we don't have any statutory authority, we don't have a budget but we do provide some oversight, so we review these reports and, the, and it's an opportunity to get some feedback and also we contribute some thoughts uh, to this as well and help with some of the prioritization. We meet on a monthly basis and so we meet and we review the, the work that's being done to date by the village. We also look at other ongoing initiatives that we have um, and um, we do a lot of education and outreach. And so I, one of the things that I've been heavily involved with through SEAC uh, and working with the village is to create a series of educational programs. And this presentation is sort of fits within that. And, um, and this presentation was, I put this together specifically for this community, but it's a, it was a lot of work. So I've invited other people to say, hey, you know, I, I already got the presentation ready. If you wanna hear it, I'd be happy to uh, share it with you. And of course, I'll be sharing the link to the, um, 
sharing the link to the, um, uh, the, the YouTube channel, uh, which will hopefully make people aware of the Ethical Humanist Society as well. So there's a, you know, so there's additional benefit. But I, 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 this, is, this is part of overall this outreach and um, uh, uh, education program that we do. And the village has been very good about updating the website and also uh, the Skokie E News talking about sustainability initiatives um, that are that are part of this uh, community climate action plan. There, we've actually had some really really good initiatives from the community, um, and we've had a couple. Of, we have a civic group called Go Green Skokie that I've been involved with directly. Um, and really they've picked up and taken a lot of leadership on some things. Um, and a couple of things that are, that are notable, the, a lot of outreach and education, um, having programs. There are gonna be two programs on sustainability at the library that are organized by Go Green Skokie. Um, another initiative that we've done is um, we, we were looking at, uh, we asked the question, well, what does sustainable commercial development look like? Right? We, 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 see it, we hear a lot about economic development and usually the conversation is, well, you either do sustainability or you do economic development. And um, I think that's a false dichotomy. I, you know, frankly, and I've said this and I've gotten goofy looks for it, but I, I say if it's not environmentally sustainable, it's not gonna be economically sustainable. And so we don't do economic development without doing uh, sustainable development. But what does that look like? And, and I think in a lot of places, particularly suburban communities, don't really know what that looks like. You know, there's, there's this tendency to have very auto-oriented, drive-through kind of business development, and, it, and it's kind of discouraging to see another drive-through Wendy's go in or another Walmart with a great, big, huge, massive parking lot and all this kind of stuff. So we, um, we started, we took, a, we took a look at Main Street um, and if you're familiar with Main Street in Skokie, near the CVS at Crawford and Skokie, and just west of there, there's a, it's, it's a pr sort of prototypical neighborhood commercial area in Skokie that, that have been, and they, they're typically very sort of haphazard. There's a lot of decline. There's vacant storefronts. And we, we went out to that area, and we said, we talked to the, a couple of the businesses there, and we talked to the neighbors, and we, we had a program last October that we called a walk down Main Street, where we invited the community to say, let's come down to Main Street, take a look at this, and ask the question, what can we do? So we had a, we had a, um, we had a, a, you know, a meeting, and we had a, a group of people come out, and it was a very sort of casual and fun event, and, and we included in that a design charrette. So we invited people to gather around tables and to just brainstorm about what might go in on Main Street. They came up with a bunch of ideas. It was really exciting. It was a lot of fun. It was a great conversation. And, um, and we created a report. We sent that to the village and said, okay, this is what we can do with Main Street. These are the ideas that came from Main Street. The idea is to start driving the narrative about what we can do for sustainable commercial development. So we get, went through the winter and came out of the winter and said, okay, what are we going to do with this walk down Main Street? We don't want this to sort of sit on a shelf somewhere. So we said, well, let's do a tactical urbanism pilot. A tactical urbanism, if you're familiar with it, is where <clears throat> you do a temporary installation of various elements. So it might be park benches, it might be art, it might, you might close off the street for a little bit. You know, there's a lot of examples of tactical urbanism that demonstrate the p p potential or the possibility. It's like a proof of concept of what can be done. So we said, okay, let's, let's do this tactical urbanism thing. So we came up with this idea for tactical urbanism, and then this is Go Green Skokie. And then we said, well, we really should talk to the businesses about you know, whether they'd be on board with this thing. And we talked to one of the businesses, and it so happens that the dance studio down there, Tana Dance Studio, has a weekly summer camp, dance camp. And the, the owner of that said, I'd like to do a weekly celebration every Friday uh, of our dance program and have the kids do a, a, you know, a dance recital and let's make it a celebration. So <clears throat> we went from there, um, a woman by the name of Lisa Levy and uh, Lisa Levy and uh, Catherine McRae working with Alejandra Gonzalez who is uh, the uh, Tana Dance Studio and they came up with this program. We've got food trucks, we've got furniture, street furniture, they're going to do, they're going to paint murals on the pavement out in front of these cities. 
the idea is to activate that area. The first one was two weeks ago. It was a huge success. The, 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 it's going to be weekly through July. I don't know how last Friday went, but, and I haven't had a chance to actually go to this. But it's been, it's been a great model, and we've engaged the Chamber of Commerce. We got the Village Community Development Department on board with doing this. So it's a, a, it's a great way to sort of activate that area, get a bunch of interested parties to sort of promote one economic development on an existing Main Street or an existing commercial area, but also create a community space, creating a, a, a sense of place within the community. Um, the other thing that the Go Green Skokie is doing is we're helping with the block parties and we're helping block party, people who are organizing block, block parties do composting. So that's something that's a, formally is part of the block party permit. You can request assistance to do composting. Uh, and there are volunteers that will go out and help you to compost whatever you can. Um, Skokie Park District has a pretty good, uh, I, I wouldn't say a detailed, but I think a pretty, a pretty good uh, sustainability action plan that they've developed. And they're trying to promote sustainability in Skokie Parks. I mentioned the Niles Township Food Pantry doing some really important work with food waste reduction and food insecurity. And there are also many schools. We have this ridiculous situation where we have five school districts or six school districts, elementary school districts in Skokie. But many of them uh, are doing some level of sustainability initiative, and including fo uh, composting, particularly with the, um, the foods. There's a lot of food waste from the schools, and they're looking at ways that they can do that. So those are some of the community things that are that have emanated or been been happening. That uh, you know some of them were in place already, and they're just moving. Uh, some of this has been stimulated by the sustainability plan, but it all sort of fits under the umbrella of sustainability and community action, climate action. So what can we do? Um, so these are general ideas. Uh, I would recommend, you know, it, wherever you live to review your community's climate action plan if they have one. If they don't have one, mention that to your elected officials and say we should have one. Um, so community uh, climate action plans really vary. Some of them, like Skokie's, are very detailed and actually very good. Uh, some of them are like Skokie's previous climate action plan, which was more of a, a sustainability light, you know, a, a statement of general of goals and a sort of value statement. Um, you, you know, and I would encourage people to try and push and get that as specific as possible. Uh, engage with neighbors, groups, and friends. So this community's done it. We had uh, Bethany Barbuti talking about the Echo Flamingo, Eco Flamingo and Zero Waste. We had uh, Pam Carlson talking about birds in the gardens. Those kind of conversations are really important. So whatever community, it's, whether it's a condo board, your local block club, you know, another community, that, another organization, your civic organization you might be involved with, um, engage in that conversation. Uh, there's also something online, I, I mentioned this Eco Challenge, I'm sure there are other things too, but Eco Challenge is a, it's really geared for more corporate kind of uh, initiatives, but it is a kind of a collective sort of shared uh, activities that you can engage in with a group of people to, to learn about and engage in sustainability activities. Uh, really important to be, be intentional about your choices, and this is something I encourage people to do. You, you know, you as an individual are not going to change the world uh, within an individual action, but there are things you can do to contribute to the solution. Um, and what I mean by be intentional, for example, whenever we leave the house, what is one thing we always have with us when we leave the house? We have our car keys, right? Well, when you grab your car keys, you don't just grab them, put them in your pocket, and head to your car. Stop and think. Is this a walkable trip? Is this a, is this a bikeable trip? Uh, can I make this trip with somebody else? Can I combine this trip with another, with other, other, um, other uh, chores or activities that I need to do? Where am I driving? You know, am I going to a place that requires me to do more driving? And you're not always going to have an answer to those questions, but just keep that thoughtful. And I mentioned the whole thing about the no mow may and how we have the shaggy lawns and how we've always assumed we have to have carefully groomed lawns. Well, we don't necessarily. There are benefits. So these are the kind of things that we can, we can be intentional and think about. Um, another thing is most of us who have 401ks, we put them in a 401k, we may not think about that mutual fund or that, um, those investments that we're putting them in. Take a look at those. Uh, there is a group called As You Sow that uh, evaluates financial investments. So if you have financial investments or a 401k, take a look at that and see what your options are. 
money talks, right? And this, this ESG thing has gotten a lot of, the corporate ESG has got generated a lot of controversy. And I think the reason it has is because money talks, right? People are paying attention to it. Um, so if you can take a look at that and say, okay, I'm gonna make investments in you know, businesses and corporations that have made a strong commitment to sustainability, that makes a difference. Feel free to experiment, try things. We don't know all the answers right now. We are gonna get a lot of things wrong uh, and we may trip upon things that we didn't expect. So give it a shot. And finally, lastly, just do it, right? Just, just do it. So building solutions, sustainability. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Charlie. Looking forward to the Q&A. Okay, uh, we uh, will now have a musical interlude that will be followed by Q&A slash conversation. Um, we are um, asking for your generosity uh, to make contributions to make the, these and other wonderful programs possible. So we, um, there are various ways that you can contribute. There will be um, information posted on the YouTube chat. Um, um, I'm trying to see if there is a, a basket here. Um, perhaps not, but you can go on the website and make a contribution there, even if you are in our space physically right now. Sorry, we are undergoing a major renovation and not everything is in place as it, as it, Sorry? <laughs> anyway, uh, do go on the Ray, website. Ray, Ray is the basket. Right. Yeah. Give money to Ray. He's good for it. Exactly. All right. Um, let me see. One more thing. So uh, we suggest a donation of $5, but any amount that you are comfortable with is greatly appreciated. And we thank all of you who sustain, speaking of sustainability, who sustain the society with your donations of time and money. We'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back. So we have a microphone in the audience, uh, right here, uh, 
in the auditorium. So I would love to have a few in-person questions to get the ball rolling. And then I will be um, looking at the, well, I won't be looking at the YouTube chat, but my, um, my helper, Glenda, is looking at the YouTube chat and sending questions uh, via my phone to me. So I will ask those on behalf of the participants there. Hey. Go Katie. Charlie, thanks so much. That was really interesting, and I also really am grateful that you spend the time and energy to be a good citizen doing this, um, and it makes me feel lazy, but thank you. Um, I'll get over my laziness after I go sit rest for a while. Um, the thing that sticks to me, I'm a policy guy, and I'm a sort of governance and how do things work, and the thing that I was thinking throughout so many of your slides is what's the what's the sand in the gears that's got nothing to do with this directly? So I'm thinking about like zoning. If we want to have different buildings, different kinds of houses, we need different zoning. I don't know if Skokie has rules about when your neighbors get to say your yard is a, land, is a nuisance, and do those make me more likely to co cut my grass too much because I know there's a rule that my neighbor can say. So there's sort of these other off camera, don't seem very interesting, but probably really matter a lot. And I'm just wondering if you guys have had a chance to start unearthing some of those or what the resistance to those Yeah, changes. so there's been a lot of talk about that. And that's a really good question because uh, this gets to, I mentioned the, the inertia, right? So you have, so you can talk about things like, you know, reducing vehicle miles traveled. Or you can, you know, reducing the amount of driving or, you know, encouraging more um, uh, public transportation or things like that. Or increasing the density, for example, the num you know, the number of people per acre that live in Skokie. And then you get into the regulations, right? So what does it take to make that happen? Uh, so we, one of the things we talked about, uh, one of the recommendations, very specific recommendations in the plan is for the village to adopt, uh, to incorporate accessory dwelling units. And accessory dwelling units are basically a second living unit uh, on your property to either be an in-law apartment or, you know, it could be for some other family member or you, or you can, you know, use it for some other purpose. Right now, Skokie doesn't permit that. Um, and even if you change the ordinance so you permitted it, then there might be other restrictions, uh, building code restrictions that would prevent that from happening. So those are, those are definitely things that we're looking at that are sort of under the hood, sort of getting into the details of doing that. Uh, your parking ordinance, for example, um, that requires minimum, your minimum parking standards. If you look around, you see all these vast parking lots. A lot of that is just minimum re parking requirements. They're required. Well, why do we have these minimum parking requirements? The parking requirements, the, the engineering and the science between, behind parking requirements has been um, uh, 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 compared to uh, uh, bloodletting as a medical practice. It's complete, it's, it's a very, very, uh, it's been called a pseudoscience. I think it's just a sort of a, it, it's a very, it's, it's not a very accurate way of doing it. And the result is we have this huge surplus of space that is dedicated for parking. So those are the kinds of things that you look at. Now, when we do ask, that, like we're talking with the, uh, we, we've been, I've been involved in another conversation in the village about affordable housing. Uh, and one of the things we talked about was accessory dwelling units. And there is some concern about accessory dwelling units in terms of public safety and fire hazards. That when you have additional dwelling units, it becomes uh, a potential fire hazard. I don't know what the data is behind that. I don't know what the reasoning or the thinking is. A lot of other communities have really had a lot of success with accessory dwelling units. Um, but that's, that's the kind of conversation and debate that we need to have. So yes, there's a, a lot of things. Building code re uh, requirements, for example. There's a lot of stuff in the building code that limits what, what you can do. Uh, the zoning code in, in Skokie is badly in need of revision. So, you know, and, the, um, and, and updating, it's really obsolete. And uh, those are the kinds of things. Now those are big, those are big, big deals, right? It takes a lot to, to do that kind of thing and that's gonna be a, uh, an important effort over time. Yes, you talked about solar panels. That's always something that we always like to see and very visible on the roofs. Um, we, looked at that, we looked into that a little bit on our own house just recently, and I finally came to the conclusion that our roof was not suitable. <laughs> just too many odd angles. Um, but then looked briefly into the alternative of investing or buying your electricity from, or whatever that means, from one of these remote site, countryside solar farms. 
is that, I mean, it's an accounting thing, <laughs> where, you, where you get your electricity from, the electronics, electrons don't know. Um, but I guess, is that a valid, is that a valid sort of alternative, and it, is there a way to fit, fit, fit that into a, a plan? Yes, yeah. great question. Um, so there are three options. One is you can install solar on your house, but not every house is suitable for solar installa installation, and there's a, a variety of reasons for that. We have solar on our house. It's worked great. It, it provides 70% of our power. Our house is well suited for it. Um, we had a fairly new roof. We didn't have any tree canopy that was covering it, we, so we didn't have to worry about the shading. And we have a nice southern exposure. So uh, our house was kind of perfect for it. But not every house is going to be. You might have big trees around your house. You don't want to cut down the trees to put in solar panels. Um, you may have an older roof, so you, you don't necessarily want to do a new installation of solar panels on an older roof. Um, it may be too expensive for you. You just might not have the capital to drop twenty grand to $25,000 on solar panels. So there are a couple of other alternatives. One is community solar. I think, Steve, that's what you're referring to, where you actually subscribe to a service to pay them to generate electricity for you. And what that, that is a very direct way. So you're actually paying for a solar installation, a solar farm somewhere. So that, and, that's, and that solar energy goes into the grid. You're right, the electrons don't know. But it is, a, you're paying for a supply of electricity that goes into the grid, and you get credit for that um, through, through the, the way that you subscribe to it and your billing from Commonwealth Edison would reflect that. The other alternative is these alternative energy providers. And that gets a little shadier, because now you're, you're, you're going to, you know, they'll say, well, we, we have wind, we have solar, and, and if you buy electricity through us, then you're contributing to the production of that. So you're not getting any cost benefit from that. You're, it, it's sort of like, okay, you're just sort of contributing to a pool of money that goes out that pays for a renewable energy supply. You, you have to be very careful with that because not all vendors are equal. Um, and so you'd have to do your research, but that's another alternative. If you don't have access to community solar, you can say, well, at least I'm going <clears> to <throat> buy my electricity from a provider that's generating it through renewable sources. And you'd have to do some research on that. Uh, Citizen Utility Board, CUB, has a lot of really good information on alternative energy providers. So if you wanted to do some research into that and see what your options were, I would recommend taking a look at what the information they have and, and uh, getting some more background on it. Skokie does have a subscription community solar uh, provider. I don't know if they're taking new subscriptions. There's, I think there's a waiting list, so you can sign up and then eventually you get in because getting these solar uh, farms online takes a certain amount of time and the, and the interest has exceeded the supply. So there is, there is some time to wait, but you can look into that and Skokie does have a program for that. So that is an option if you can't put solar panels onto your house. Well, thank you again, Charlie. A really great presentation. So two questions. Where does Old Orchard sort of fit into sustainability for Skokie? And it would seem tremendous solar potential for the roofs there. And then personally, uh, I have a Prius hybrid. I have the dual air conditioning. So I was running the heat, dur heat pump during the winter. Um, and I always charge the Prius at night. My electric consumption has gone up about 80%. Am I helping things? <laughs> <laughs> um, so generally, electrification is helping, right? So if you're not using natural gas or if you're not burning fossil fuels, um, you're helping. Now, the electrification, you know, depending on what your power supply is. So, so Illinois, we're part of a, a grid that goes to the East Coast. So there's actually part of our power grid, a lot of it is coal generated. Illinois specifically, most electric power in Illinois is generated by nuclear. Um, but since we share that power supply with other states, we have kind of a mix. Um, so when you're, getting, when you're getting power from ComEd, it could be coming from dirty sources, it could be coming from clean sources, we, we don't really know. Generally though, if you're electrifying, that's the direction to go. Um, <clears throat> so a heat pump, is, well, heat pumps are generally more efficient. So a heat pump is, is a good way to go to, uh, to heat and cool your home. Um, and there's air-sourced heat pumps, and then there's, 
geothermal pumps. Geothermal is a lot more expensive to put in, but that actually uses the energy of the earth. An air source would, would be basically converting your gas furnace to an electric generate, you know, electric heating through the heat pump. Um, as far as Old Orchard is concerned, I don't really know, we haven't really talked about Old Orchard specifically in terms of what they do for sustainability. I don't know if Westfield has a sustainability plan or a climate action plan. That's a great question. You know, uh, and probably the next thing for us to do is to look at the big institutional players in, in, the, in the community, like Westfield, the, the um, North Shore Health Services, uh, the Tech Park, uh, maybe some of the larger manufacturers like along McCormick, um, maybe a Walmart, and say, okay, what are their climate action plans and get a handle on what they're doing and maybe we can tap in and take advantage of some things they're doing. There, there are some corporate, a lot of corporations are actually doing some pretty cool things um, and a lot of corporations are not. <laughs> and it would be good to know that and be able to, to take advantage of that. And that's, not, that's one area where we have not really looked in any kind of detail in terms of what the what the large institutional players are doing. Yeah, great talk. Okay, I'm gonna ask a few questions from YouTube land, but first I wanna follow up with my own question on something you said. You said that most of the electricity that Illinois uses is generated by nuclear, is that? So most of the electricity generated in Illinois is nuclear. But we are part of a power grid, and I don't, I don't, I, I, I am definitely not the expert to talk about this. But most of the power grid, if you, there are there are various power grids, the regional power grids, and ours tends to lean toward the east coast. So, um, so the grid that we draw on has a combination of power sources: nuclear, coal, natural gas, um, primarily. I don't know if there's much hydro in our in our region, uh, but. If you look at Illinois specifically, most of the electric generation in Illinois, I think it's a pretty high amount. It's almost 60 or 70 percent is nuclear uh, power. Well, there's a there's a, a, a carbon-free uh, energy source, so yay for that. At least I think so. Okay, a uh, question from YouTube: To what extent can climate change be reversed as opposed to diminished? I don't know. I don't, I don't think we're on the track. We are not anywhere near a trajectory of reversing climate change. Even if we stop generating more um, carbon you know, dioxide, the, the trends of climate change would continue. Uh, what we're trying to do is mitigate that so that it doesn't get worse, right? Um, but you know, the, 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 the atmosphere and the environment is a big system. And we've been, we've been pushing that system for several hundred years. If we take our foot off the accelerator, there's still, you know, the car, it keeps rolling, right? So, um, so I don't know when we'll get to a point where we, you know, where we actually see a diminishing of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What we can do is we can take steps now so that we're, we're not contributing additional carbon dioxide to make the situation worse. And there are, you know, they talk about carbon sequestration. I butchered that word. Okay, but I think you got it. Um, uh, you know, there may be technologies that are uh, developed, and there's certainly a lot of investment in this to sort of suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That could certainly accelerate some of that reversal. But even then, you know, the, you're talking about oceans. You're talking about very large systems with, where this, this momentum is already going. Another question is, is any part of the Skokie plan requiring a partnership from Chicago or any other neighboring towns? Uh, no, that's a, that's a good question though. So we do not have anything in the plan that specifically um, involves any kind of intergovernmental, intergovernment, these usually intergovernmental agreements, IGAs, um, but there are, there are potentially opportunities for that. Um, and certainly, you know, we, you know, Lincolnwood, Skokie, Morton Grove, uh, there are also the various government entities like the park district and the school districts. There are certainly plenty of opportunities to engage in sort of cooperative efforts. Um, and of course, the metropolitan, you know, MWRD, our water, water district, 
is another opportunity to have uh, multiple municipality kind of uh, cooperation in, in sustainability efforts. So besides my inertia and our collective inertia, who's against, like, is there any op oppositional f active force or is it just the inertia? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Is, yes. Who's so, against this? So in, in, I'll speak to Skokie. I, you know, I, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of people out there. Um, there I think the sentiments that of resistance, of active resistance, are we have a carbon economy. That carbon economy has delivered a lot of really high standard of living, and if and if we gave that up, there'd be a lot of problems. So that's one thing. There's also this sense of well, it's it, it, there's this denial, which I think is fading because the, the evidence is overwhelming. The, the, the refusal to believe that human activity is actually contributing to that. Well, that, I mean, there, there's so much evidence out there to that, and we're experiencing so much of that reality that, that I think that's a fading as an argument. The, what is emerging is this argument that if we, it would be more expensive to cool the planet than, those, you know, than, to, than to heat it, right? So if we, if we stop doing what we did with our carbon economy, the cost of that would be greater than what we're doing right now. Um, in Skokie, I don't think it's so much of a, an act of resistance to the, to the climate change. I think that's a fairly minimal thing. I think there are two things uh, that come up in Skokie. One, you asked about the brass tacks of getting into the code. When you start getting into those specific regulations and those specific standards, that's where you start meeting resistance. You know, so I, I talked about the the idea of uh, increasing the density of the community. Right. Well, a lot of people like single-family homes. They like their single-family home in particular. And if you started saying, "Well, we're going to we're going to get rid of single-family and we're going to allow multi-unit buildings in a single-family district," you're going to generate a lot of resistance. Um, if you, if we're talking about parking requirements, you know, let's let's reduce or eliminate parking requirements. There's going to be a lot of resistance to that. So those, that's where that sort of, it's kind of like a Velcro thing. There's a little little catches, right? And there's always there's always going to be something that somebody, some constituency, says, no, I don't want to see that happen. And that's that's where you're going to see the see the kind of resistance. The second is, I think there is. Um, very different perspectives on what the role of municipal government is and what the capacity of municipal government is. So there are some things where we get the argument, well, that's a state level issue, right? The state needs to pass some legislation on it, or the federal government needs to provide some money for this, or, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the, that's, a, that's a private business, uh, a corporate matter. That's not something that we should be involved with. Um, and, and so that's another area where it's not necessarily an active resistance, but it's just a different perspective on what the role and the responsibility is of the, of the municipality. There's a, an interesting technical question. In the 60s, climate change was slowed, masked by pollution blocking sunlight. Uh, I, I don't, let's just take that as a given, I guess. It has been suggested sending reflective dust to upper atmosphere could mitigate reverse climate change. Thoughts? Um, <laughs> so what, what they're, uh, I forget the word uh, that they're, that it's called, but. Geoengineering? Well, geoengineering is, that's what he's talking about. But there's, what, what, he's, what, what, what he's getting, what the question is getting to is there's amount of solar radiation that comes into the atmosphere. And if we can reflect some of that back out to space, we can reduce the amount of heat that is generated or, or that it comes into the planet. And there has been talk about putting these crystals or something up in the atmosphere and that would reflect the sunlight before it came down into the atmosphere and then reduce the amount of heat that's coming in. Um, yeah, I don't know enough about that to have an intelligent answer for it. I personally am like, okay, uh, have, you know, it would have to, we, there, there are two concerns that I have. One, whether it would actually work. And two, what would be the, the consequences of doing something like that that we haven't, we're not aware of? Uh, so I think that's a, it's a, I don't think it's a, a it's a, um, a, 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 an idea that we can act on now. I think it probably is worthwhile to, to explore it a little bit more and see, well, what is the possibility? What is the potential? But uh, I, I don't think it's an actionable kind of thing at this point. Plus, you're talking about massive scale. I mean, it's, uh, um, 
it's it's a um, it's a it's a big deal. I think if we'd be better off just allowing volcanoes to just send up dust and cool the planet off periodically. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I I don't know. I I wouldn't. I, yeah, I don't have very much to say about that particular uh, strategy. I wanted to follow up on the old orchard question because that's a big concrete contradiction in the report. So much business now in Skokie seems north of Dempster and north of Church Street to Old Orchard. And like even you were talking about drive-throughs and everything. I mean, how do you uh, balance that with less driving or people staying at home and you know less traffic in the community when so much of the tax revenue is generated uh, you know, from the business that's, again, uh, balance way north now and you know with all the you know climate things we're talking about and in that report so i think you're uh, getting to two issues that are really uh, really important one is you know obviously the climate initiatives and climate action and how we build our community how do we build our community in a way that is going to be sustainable and then getting into where where what what is the what are the economic conditions that we're dealing with um, and, and those, are, those are really important questions. I think it, it comes down to what kind of community do we want to build? Um, and I don't think there's a clear consensus on that. Uh, the other is we do have a shifting economy in Skokie. We, Skokie historically in the past had a very large manufacturing sector, had a very robust retail sector. Um, and in the last 20 years, that's all changed. The manufacturing has pretty much evacuated Skokie. Um, retail is, of course, been transformed through the internet, uh, and so the, 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 what Skokie has relied on in the past in terms of the brick and mortar retail has been pretty significantly adversely affected. Uh, this is affecting Old Orchard too. Westfield is, um, is you know, has shopping malls that are struggling. They closed a shopping mall in San Francisco, downtown San Francisco. Old Orchard is actually doing pretty well, but Westfield is proposing to tear down some of the retail and put in housing. That's one of the big proposals. So I think fundamentally that's a good thing. Uh, you know, it's an adaptive reuse to housing. It has an impact on our tax base. Um, and I think we, we need to uh, carefully evaluate what impact that has and, and you know, cre modulate our expectations about where our taxes are coming from based on some of these changes that are that are really transforming the community. But it's a very good question. Um, you know, we have a sort of strip mall retail along Tui Avenue, which I think is disastrous. And there, and we have some of that along Skokie Boulevard, which is, is equally disastrous. It generates a lot of traffic, but it, not a lot of business. Um, and I think we need to really fundamentally rethink that. Consequently, the, the work we're doing with the walk down Main Street is to be a sort of a template or a prototype of what a commercial development might look like. We're also talking about in the zoning ordinance changing. We have a lot of single-use zoning, the Euclidean. It's called Euclidean zoning, where each zone has its own very highly specified land uses, and we're and we're talking about changing that to have more mixed use, so that rather than having, you know, commercial street be all commercial retail, to incorporate office, you know, service industry, housing in along that so it's a it's a much more dynamic and a much and hopefully more economically resilient kind of development but also promotes um, development that is more walkable so that you don't have to drive you get away from this land use and transportation paradigm of a single occupancy vehicle single destination trip but really either combining trips or eliminating trips by enabling people to access what they need uh, through uh, either walking or biking or transit. I want to I ask you a chance to give us some good news. What is a strategy you, have you found a strategy on a personal level that when you're talking to people who maybe are either ignorant or resistant, which is two different things, is there a strategy of, um, of sort of rhetorical strategy or specific point that seem to start shifting mind and changing the inertia? Like, at a personal level? Like, how do you not just be the nutty neighbor who's always just obsessed about biking and doing the things and having a messy lawn versus the guy from whom I've learned and has caused me to think a little differently? So <clears throat> I, I don't know that I can say that I've had uh, any particular notable success, but um, 
One of the things I do, I try and do, is acknowledge the concerns that people have. Um, so, and, 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 and to listen, right? So when somebody's talking about something that is, um, I was talking to somebody about, for example, um, water and water, you know, like he was complaining about the government putting restrictions on how water can be used. And, you know, I, I think a lot of times there are trade-offs, right? It's like, okay, what are, you, what, are the, what are the costs you're willing to accept and what benefits you're trying to pursue? And to just acknowledge that, but also then try and, you know, address the issue in the way that they value, right? Um, so a lot of times I think it's a, um, when, when talking about some of these things and sustainability, I think if you can, if you can get into the nuances of, of you know, what the trade-offs are and what, what, what they value, what the, what the balance is, then I think you can start having a substantive conversation when you're talking to them on their terms. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we're in a period where a lot of this, there's a lot of deep suspicion and a lot of cynicism. I wouldn't even say skepticism, but just plain cynicism. I, I, you know, I just don't believe what they say. Well, you, you know, there's not much you can do with that. But if you talk to them from their experience and then start saying, okay, what are the implications? And then, you know, um, get into, you know, talking about more substantive, um, tangible things that, that they recognize and that are um, uh, of value to them, then I think you can start making some headway. There are some times you're just not going to do it because they have, people have different values, you know. They just have different values. And, uh, you, you know, to recognize and acknowledge that and say, well, that, that, you know, it's a matter of what, what you think is valuable. Um, if there are no more questions, I will ask one final one. I'm personally confused about the value of recycling. Not metals, I know metals and glass, but plastic and paper and some other stuff. I mean, my understanding is that we used to essentially ship it to, I think, maybe China or elsewhere, and there was money to be made from that. There is no longer money to be made from that, and so it's an effort that's futile. Um, so can you comment on that? Sure. So we've had this conversation many times in the Sustainability Commission because uh, the diversion rates in Skokie plateaued, and then, then we ran into the China's not buying plastic anymore problem. Uh, and then you run into, well, the standards keep changing. Like, we'll, we'll recycle this, but not this. And then there's this that can be recycled and not that. And now we're doing, going through the same process with composting. Uh, you know, the comp what you can compost and what you can't compost keeps changing. And, it, and, and, it, and after a while, you just throw up your arms. Like, what am I supposed to do? At one point, I did propose with the plastic thing, I, I, it, out of frustration, I said, this is ridiculous. Why are we recycling plastic at all? Let's stop. We, the, part of the problem is we want to encourage people to recycle something, right? Now, paper and metal and glass, there's a market for those. So there's, there is an opportunity to recycle. Plus, it's relatively simple to do. Plastic, and, and of course, the market varies, right? So sometimes, sometimes it, there's a good market for it. Sometimes there's not. Nonetheless, glass, paper, and cardboard and uh, metal are easy, right? So uh, I, I suggested, I said, let's just stop collecting plastic and let's just encourage people to do the simple stuff with the idea that more people would do the simple stuff rather, and, and the benefit of that, the effort, the benefit from the effort of promoting recycling would be an increased uh, diversion of those materials. Um, and, and clearly the, the value we get from the effort we try and educate people about recycling plastic is nominal, if any at all. Um, <clears throat> I think they, what I, when I tell people, and this is with the same thing with uh, Steve was asking about solar, you know, the best thing you can do, the most effective thing that you can do to, you know, uh, be more efficient about the use of materials is to use less. So Recycling, yes, I share your skepticism about a lot of the recycling. I share a lot of the frustration about recycling. I still do the recycling. We do the recycling, you know, um, continually. I've, 
I've made a point of trying to figure out and learning all the plastic recycling, and I, I don't ask me to explain it to you. I don't know the numbers, what's being recycled today. I have to look it up every time, but I make that effort. Um, but the, most, the best thing that you can do, the simplest thing and the thing that's gonna deliver the most value is to just simply use less stuff. Use less power, use less stuff, and that will contribute to it. But yes, you know, if, if recycling plastic is too much of a, a headache to figure out, all right, everybody shares the same headache, but do recycle the, you know, recycle something, plastic, I mean, not plastic, but paper, you know, um, glass, metal, and the like, and that'll be contributing to something. Well, thanks so much, Charlie. Okay. Really appreciate it. All right. <laughs>